Hi, my name is Li Yizhou, a PhD student from Imperial College London. I'm here to talk about high frequency trading on decentralized on-chain exchanges. This work is joined with Kai Huaqing, Christoph Torres, Duke Li, and Arthur Jobay. So why do we need a DAX? There are typically two types of actors in an exchange, namely the liquidity provider, which is Alice, and the liquidity taker, which is Bob. For traditional exchanges, if Alice and Bob wants to make a trade, they need to both trust a centralized service provider, and this centralized entity executes the trade on their behalf. This is how things would work if everything goes as planned. But there are other possibilities. For example, if the exchange is hacked, then these assets are lost. So how do we solve this problem? Decentralized exchanges or DEXs allow different actors to participate in financial markets while retaining full custody of their funds. It relies on the underlying blockchain to clear the trades. The price discovery and the trade matching are encoded in smart contracts. The logic within the smart contract is completely transparent and anyone can check that the smart contract is executed correctly. Over the last year, we have observed a dramatic increase in the trading volume of the decentralized exchanges. As we can see in this slide, the trading volume increased from under 1 billion US dollars to more than 50 billion within a single year. This trading volume is already significant even when compared with the most successful centralized exchanges. For example, on April the 22nd, the total DEX trading volume is already more than 7% of Binance and 1.4% of Nasdaq. So given this incredible high trading volume, one major question is, does high frequency trading work on decentralized exchanges? And can the market be manipulated to attack the traders? The answer is yes. On blockchain-based decentralized exchanges, transactions are, are executed by the miners. The traders, however, are typically not directly connected with the miners. Therefore, in order to let the miners know about their transactions, traders need to broadcast the transactions over the public P2P network. The miners have a local transaction pending queue also known as the mempool, which stores the transactions it receives over the P2P network. So once a trader's transaction is received, it will be added into this mempool. Every round, a miner will be elected, which orders the transactions and generate the next block. Since permissionless blockchains are open source, the default transaction ordering strategy is known to, to everyone. Ethereum miners, for example, by default, orders transactions based on transaction fees paid per unit of computation. The attacker can follow the same rules and then place its own trans transactions right before or right after the victim's transaction. In more detail, in order to manipulate the transaction order, the attacker needs to connect to as many nodes as possible to gain speed advantage on the network layer. This is because the spy node aims to broadcast its own transactions to the miners before the victim's transaction is executed. So the earlier the, the, the adversary uh, detects the transaction, the more time it has to react. For instance, the attackers can perform front running. In the optimal scenario, the adversary detects the victim's transaction before the miner even receives the transaction. Then the adversary issues a transaction with a higher transaction fee price and broadcasts both the victim's transaction and its own transaction on the P2P network. The attacker can also perform backrunning transaction, uh, backrunning attacks. In this scenario, the optimal strategy is to configure the same transaction fee price then the adversary sends the backrunning transaction immediately after the victim trans victim's transaction to the miner. In this paper, we focus on one specific type of, of DEXs called 
Automated Market Maker DEX, or AMM. AMM DEX relies on smart contracts um, to, put, to accumulate liquidities. There is the liquidity provider, which is Alice, uh, who provides both asset X and Y into the liquidity pool. And there is the liquidity taker who sells asset X plus fees to Alice for asset Y. So um, the idea is um, to let a smart contract to do the market making. The simplest AMM mechanism is a constant product market maker, which keeps the product X times Y as a constant for a given asset pair. Um, this pricing formula has three properties. Firstly, it offers instant liquidity, no matter how big or how small the trade size is. Secondly, the smart contract automatically adjusts the price. Um, the purchase of, of asset X, for example, will increase the price of X and decrease the price for Y. Lastly, the ratio of asset X and Y is determined, uh, uh, determines the price. Here we give a concrete example. Um, in this plot, the x-axis represents the amount of asset x in the pool, and the y-axis represents the amount of asset y in the pool. Um, so the pool starts with 10 units of asset x and 30 units of asset y. The product is equal to 300. So let's say a taker wants to transact five units of asset x for asset y. Um, so the x-axis will shift from 10 units of asset x to 15. And in order to keep the product as a constant, the amount of asset Y will, in the exchange will decrease uh, from 30 to 20. Therefore, the taker will receive 10 units of asset Y. As we have shown in the previous slide, when the liquidity taker makes a trade, the AMM state or the price shifts along the bounding curve. Expected price slippage is the expected increase or decrease in price based on the trading volume and the available liquidity at the beginning of the trade. However, there are other participants in the market. Due to concurrent transactions, the actual slippage can be different from the expected slippage. Here, for example, let's assume transaction D is executed before transaction C. Because transaction D already shifted the market state downwards before transaction C is, exec is executed. Transaction C will have a worse execution price due to unexpected slippage. Note that unexpected slippage can also result in better prices. For example, transaction D might be trading in reverse direction, therefore transaction C will have a better price than the, than the, expect than the expectation. So in order to limit the impact of unexpected slippage from concurrent transactions, traders typically configure a slippage protection threshold, which is slightly above the expected slippage. Therefore, if transaction C goes beyond the slippage protection threshold as a result of transaction D, then transaction C will be reverted. It will not be executed. This slippage protection mechanism, however, makes sandwich attacks possible. So the idea here is to manipulate the market and maximize the victim's um, slippage. The adversary can emit two transactions to exploit the slippage protection before transaction V is confirmed. So as an example, let's say the victim issues a transaction to swap asset X to Y. The adversary then issues two transactions, A1 and A2, for the first transaction, A1, the adversary front runs the victim and it also swaps asset X to Y. If everything goes as expected, then the victim's transaction, um, the slippage of the victim's transaction will be maximized, um, but the slippage protection will not be triggered. The adversary in the second transaction back runs the victim by uh, transacting asset Y to asset X. So transaction A1 and A2 then forms a profitable arbitrage. 
Okay, so let's go through the whole process again. In the first step, the victim sends a transaction TV on the P2P network through a lightweight node or full node. Um, recall that the trader needs to broadcast this transaction on the P2P network. So each node on the P2P network can observe the slippage, protect, the slippage protection settings. The adversary needs to operate a spy node, which connects to as many nodes as possible to detect the victim's transaction before the miner executes the transaction. Um, the adversary then determines if the victim's transaction is profitable. If it is profitable, then it will issue two transactions, A1 and A2 on P2P network. If everything goes as planned, the miner will receive transaction A1 and A2 before the confirmation of transaction B and then executes them in the exact order the, the, the adversary wants. So it will execute A1 first and then B and then A2. As a result, the victim suffers a much worse slippage and then the adversary gains revenue from the arbitrage um, performed by transaction A1 and A2. On this slide, we show the analytical evaluation of sandwich attacks on a specific market state. We assume the victim transacts easier to Psi. Psi is just some cryptocurrency asset. On the x-axis, we show that the amount of ether transacted by the victim. On the y-axis, we show the amount of ether transacted by the adversary in transaction A1. If the victim transacts 40 ether for Psi uh, at a slippage protection of 0.5%, this line here, then the optimal strategy for the adversary is to transact 18.5 ether in the first transaction. This attack will realize a profit of 0.08 ether, which is equivalent to 11 USD uh, at the time of writing. So here is the important takeaway from this figure. We can observe that there is a threshold here, the white area, um, where if the victim's transaction size is below this threshold, then the sandwich attack is not profitable, no matter how much easier the adversary transacts. Intuitively, this is because the revenue the adversary gains could not cover the cost of the attack. We call this threshold the minimum profitable victim input, or MVI. This threshold can be numer numerically derived for any market states. So here comes the, one of the mitigation mechanisms uh, we proposed in the paper for sandwich attacks we can disable transactions above the MVI. If the liquidity taker wants to make a big trade, for example, 122 ether, 123 ether, then he needs to split the transaction into smaller ones. In this case, five smaller trades. Um, this is, by the way, this is a very nice website uh, that the other researchers developed. Um, to help traders to divide the transactions. You can find the link of the website here. One of the disadvantages of dividing transactions is um, the trader will need to pay higher transaction fees for each of the transactions. So um, there are also other mitigation mechanisms which we have discussed in the appendix of the paper. Another interesting question is what will happen when there are multiple um, trader, multiple sandwich attackers? We simulated the outcome and our results suggest that having multiple attackers does divide the total revenue among the adversaries in expectation. All the attackers also need to pay higher transaction fees uh, overhead. Uh, note that if the blockchain is congested, then we observe that break, the break even is harder to attain. We also found another uh, sandwich attack pattern uh, in the paper, which we will not go into details, but the adversary acts as a provider instead of acting as a taker in this case. So um, in summary, the transparency of blockchain-based exchanges in combination with the latency for transactions to be processed makes market manipulation feasible. Thanks for listening to our presentation.